welcome to Turkey and we're here in Istanbul, the biggest city in Turkey, a city of 14 million people and this place has been called the cradle of civilization. We're starting our tour here at the Topkapi Palace which is the palace of the first um, Ottoman emperor dating back to 1453. The palace is built around a series of four courtyards and each with um, various important buildings. And in the 16th century you might have heard of Suleiman the Magnificent, he lived here. And also this place was the centre of the Muslim faith uh, under the Caliphs from about the 16th century on right through to 1920s when the state of Turkey was born. Down there you can see the old city walls dating back to Roman times. And this is the Bosphorus Sea, which separates Asia and Europe. So it's a pretty important piece of water. And this area is called the Tulip Garden. And that's because they plant tulips here. And what I didn't know was that tulips actually originated here from Istanbul and not from the Netherlands. They were imported there. And so that's an interesting little fact we learnt today. And these don't look very tulip-like because it's not tulip season. In the palace here, they've got lots and lots of things going way back to the time of the Ottomans and lots of relics of the past too. For example, in this building here, which is the holy relics, they've got a little bit of um, the Prophet Muhammad's hair off his beard. They've got a footprint of him. They've got John, um, St. John, a gold version of his arm, and they've even got Moses' rod, you know the one that budded? It's in there too. Um, and the turban from that Abraham wore. So they've tried to gather together relics from the past, whether they are the real ones, who knows, but they certainly are valuing their history. And all the buildings are beautifully decorated. There's lots of gold being used here. And over there is the um, Emperor's harem. And he used to have four wives, um, just in case uh, one of them didn't, uh, the main one didn't produce a male child. And here we have the council room where the Ottoman Empire was ruled from. Quite uh, magnificent surroundings. And when the Sultan wanted to watch the proceedings, he did so from behind this gold gilded cage. It's great how the palace is set in all these lovely gardens and courtyards. There's hardly anybody here yet because the cruise ships haven't reached here. It's a quiet day. If anyone rebelled against the uh, emperor, they chopped their heads off and they stuck them here at the gate to the palace so that everybody would know that, um, hey, you don't mess with the emperor. Now we're going to the uh, Church of St. Sophia and it's now a museum. This church has been built three times, initially by um, Constantine's son in 390, then it was destroyed, a few years later it was rebuilt and then um, a few years later it had to be rebuilt again. Some of the early artefacts here date right back to the initial days when this place was built. Saint Sophia wasn't an actual saint, the meaning is of divine wisdom. So this is the Church of Divine Wisdom and for 800 years it was the biggest building ever built by man until St Paul's in London was made. Up there is Jesus, the light of the world. And then this uh, door here, which is the way into the nave, they reckon it's made out of the wood from Noah's Ark. How about that? This particular church was built in 527, and it really is quite amazing. Up there, there's mosaics quite fantastic.
when the Ottomans came into power, they converted this into a mosque. And so, and they covered up all of the Christian um, pictures and mosaics. And so for 1400 years, nobody knew that there were Christian things in under here. So when this was a Christian church, they had the altar facing Jerusalem. And then when there was the, the takeover, the Muslims had to change it to face Mecca. And that wasn't in the Jerusalem wasn't a true east from here, so they had to move it slightly off center, as you can see there. When Ataturk came to power, um, after the First World War, he changed this from being a mosque into being a museum, as it is today. The scale of this place is just incredible. It is so big. And it's an amazing thing to think that it was built in the 500s. And here it is still here today. Earthquakes have ravaged it. They've uncovered uh, underneath the um, plaster all these lovely mosaics. It's an incredible testament to the uh, genius of people in the past who could create buildings like this. Quite superb. Here's an example of the plaster and then the beautiful mosaics underneath. And down there is where the Ottoman emperors were crowned. This building certainly has an amazing history. Back in Roman times they had a hippodrome here and you can see uh, down there are some of the stones from the old hippodrome but when the um, Ottoman Empire came in they replaced them all with um, mosques and we're now going to go over and see the big blue mosque but there's a monument here that dates back to Egyptian times it's like the one that uh, you see in London it was actually first erected in the 4th century. And here's another obelisk. And it was built in memory of um, Constantine. But it got damaged during the Crusades. As they came through here on the uh, way to Israel. And now we're in the Blue Mosque. And once again it's a pretty impressive structure. To get inside we have to get um, kitted out so that the ladies have a headdress and the gents don't show their knees. You look very cute there. Once again it's on a massive scale and the tiles here are all from Nicaea and the men come and pray here. Uh, five times a day. There's a fella over there reading his newspaper. And the women have a balcony up there where they go. Now we're going to brave the Grand Bazaar. And it's quite a place. Apparently there's 4,433 shops, so we've only got two hours. I suppose we better get going. Yeah, and it's all life here, lots of people, lots to buy. You can buy Turkish rugs and um, flutes and beautiful bags and lovely leather hats and Turkish delight. The market's all under cover. It's not selling cheap stuff, there's uh, jewellery and rugs and all sorts of expensive stuff, so I don't think that's where we'll be making any purchases, the Grand Bazaar. I've enjoyed our quick visit to Istanbul. Everybody's trying to sell you things and there's all sorts of um, activities going on, people everywhere. I suppose with um, 14 million people you can't help that. But it's been interesting to see the historical sites too. Now we're in Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey. And we've come here to Ataturk's mausoleum. He is revered um, in Turkey because he was the first president. 
that uh, established the Republic in 1923. It's obviously a very important thing for Turkey, just like it was for Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and Mao in uh, China. And the uh, thousands come here every day to look at his mausoleum and to go through the museum like we're going to. And here's where Ataturk is buried, underneath this great piece of marble. Ataturk declared Turkey a republic in 1923 and moved the capital from Istanbul here uh, to Ankara. And then he died in 1938. Ataturk was obviously a great soldier and also a great political leader. In the First World War, he led the, the local forces against the British at Gallipoli. And then after that, there was a war of independence where he led uh, the Turkish forces against the Greeks and won. And that led to the establishment of the modern state of Turkey. And in Turkey now, it's a very modern state with lots of freedoms. There's freedom of um, religion, there's freedom for women and it's a, it's a testament to his uh, leadership that um, Ataturk provided way back then. So Turkey says thank you very much Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. And here we have an unusual site. This is a salt lake. It's the second biggest lake in the whole of Turkey and it's really thick with salt. The only thing that um, lives in this lake are brine shrimps. Look at all the people come here to put their toes in the, in the lake, in the salt. Wow, it's so bright. Bright, you can hardly see. It's like being in the snow. Can you hear? Crunch. Hear the, hear the crunching? Am I game enough to t try it? Yeah, oh, taste right, it. Okay. Oh, it's like putting your, your your finger in ice. Can you see that little crystals? Oh, yes. Uh, it is <laughs> that salty. <laughs> Now we're in Cappadocia in um, central Turkey, in Gorima, and we're going to see the Gorima Monastery, and you're hardly going to believe what you're going to see today. It dates back to the third century, to the very beginnings of Christianity, and um, Gregor and George, the two original um, early saints, lived here. And their monastery was um, set in the side of the hills there, cut into, because they were short. This area was created by um, volcanic action, and the material's quite soft, so they were able to cut their homes and their monastery into it reasonably easily. There are about 3,000 of these little churches in this area, and um, they've all got a, a ceilings and little um, pillars and naves. And they're only about five meters across, just quite small. Initially they decorated the churches quite simply, but then um, they created frescoes like this. And uh, some of them got uh, damaged by the Arabs later on. So this is quite a place. It's amazing to see the, um, the, the development of the characters as they put them on the walls as well, but also the decimation that we saw in Egypt, the defacing of them, and then the restoration. It's all very historic. This whole area is a monastery. People lived down in the valley there and um, came up into the monastery, of course, to worship and pray. And here is the refectory or the kitchen and dining room area. You can imagine the monks sitting here having their lunch and their dinner. And this is the view that they looked out on. Pretty magnificent, isn't it? After 
the um, third century, Christianity was legalized, if you like, by Constantine, and um, then they didn't have to have such uh, be hidden away so much. But they continued to live here in these monasteries, and we've got a history that goes right through from the um, third century right through to the 1100s. These rocks are called fairy chimneys and they're uh, created by the volcanic action. This one's called the, Cath the Chapel of St. Catherine, Catherine. Wow. <laughs> it's fascinating to capture a picture of what life was like for the early Christians. Paul came from here, from um, Cappadocia, and um, he spent much of his time here meeting the various churches and uh, we can capture an idea of what life, life was like for him moving through this part of Turkey. And here's what it was like. You can see the uh, fairy chimneys down there in the village of Goreme where they all, all lived. This is right at the heart of Cappadocia. How would you like to live in a house like that? I think the Turkish have done a good job in getting the balance between catering for tourism and for keeping it in its natural state. It's not too touristed up and um, you can take in the full impact of the beauty just by these little side things on the side of the road. These um, cones were inhabited right through to the 1960s. So they date right back to the very early Christians and the little wee holes that you can see in, in some of them are where they kept their pigeons because they needed the pigeons for fertilizer. This part of Cappadocia is called Pigeon Valley and you can see the amazing city built into the rocks over there and pigeons everywhere. Now we're in the valley of the fairy chimneys and you can see that the uh, cones this time have got little caps on them caused by having different uh, types of rocks that uh, were put forward in the various eruptions. And I think they're supposed to look like perhaps fairy tale castles, maybe that's where the fairy comes, I'm not really sure, but that's what they look like to me. And once again there are churches and troglodyte homes built into these uh, little um, cone-shaped rocks. We've been to Petra in Jordan and Mesa Verde in the United States and Bryce Canyon and uh, this place is, <laughs> it's like that, amazing. That one looks like it's going to split. And they're really, really big. And once again, they've built their houses and church into the rocks. I don't think I'd like to put my shop just there. Look what's up above. And what do you reckon that one looks like? It's a camel. We're now in a shop and one of the specialties of Turkey is turquoise and turquoise means Turkish stone and they reckon they make the best turquoise in the world. Another feature of Turkey is the hand-painted pottery. This is a Hittite design going back 13 centuries. Look at the beautiful um, painting that's gone on here to create each one. All freely hand painted. It's incredible what they've done here. The designs are all hand painted and some of them with brushes and 
However, this is the family's original designs because this is a family company and it really is very, very impressive. <laughs> Now we're in an underground city and they have eight different stories in this particular city housing um, thousands of people and uh, this is a chapel with lots of little rooms coming off it. Um, these um, underground cities were built because the Arabs came in, in from the 800s on to um, attack the early Christian communities and they had to build underground cities to protect themselves. Quite impressive, quite amazing that they were able to do this kind of thing. Just goes on and on, multi-story. We're on level four and there's another four down there, it goes down 75 meters. Well, frankly, that was just amazing to see a whole civilization in there on eight stories, rooms, countless rooms. They reckon it held up to 20,000 people. And you're going in and out, it was just an amazing experience. One of the main industries in Cappadocia is ballooning. And just look at this, they're everywhere. That sound is the sound of the uh, gas being burnt to create the hot air. It's quite a sight. Well, that was an amazing day, full on all day in the 38 degree heat. But it was wonderful to experience all those things. And the best thing now is we're off for a, a dip in the pool. So it's a great way to finish a day. Yes, it has been a demanding day. Probably the most demanding day we've um, ever had on any of our tours because it's been so hot. We saw lots of things and Cappadocia certainly is an amazing place. In the 13th century, the Turks came to Turkey. They came from Central Asia and they had these caravanserai every 50 or 60 k's so that they could have a stopping place along the way. So a caravan would consist of um, camels and donkeys and they'd stay here for the night. There's a mosque and various facilities, refectory, kitchens, and so on. Sort of like the, a hotel. And this is the winter section where um, the animals were kept, and it's kept them dry and warm. Smells a bit still. It smells a bit like it. <laughs> the animals have been in there recently. <laughs> yeah, I reckon. <laughs> and over there in two stories where we're they slept. So, quite a modern caravan park, really. One of the distinctive features of Turkey are the whirling dervishes, and there are Muslim sect who whirl around trying to get closer to God. They're followers of Mevlana, and they spent used to spend a, a thousand and one days in here getting ready for it. Ataturk uh, banned the sect and uh, now they just do shows, religious shows. Hello. 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 I love you. I love you. <laughs> now we're in Pamukkale and uh, it's really hot today. It's going to be over 38 degrees and look up there. That is not snow, that is limestone. These are the famous limestone terraces. These terraces are very, very ancient and led to the establishment of Hierapolis in this uh, area, which is an old 
Roman town that we're going to visit next. Quite spectacular, but it certainly does look like snow. Now we're going to look around Hierapolis. It dates back to the 3rd century BC. It was surrounded by an 8 kilometre long wall and um, those terraces I showed you and you can see here it's still being excavated today to explore various aspects. This is an old gymnasium. In its heyday about 80,000 people lived here and they were attracted to the area by the springs that led to these terraces, the healing qualities of it. Over there are the old Roman baths and they had um, hot, warm and cold. Behind them there is the uh, necropolis, the graveyard, and the Roman Emperor, Emperor Marcus Aurelius is buried there. And here we have the Roman gate that leads to the main street of the city and the agora, the marketplace. You can see the pillars here. Um, that lined the main road. In addition to the uh, Roman community that was here, there was a strong Jewish community and of course a Christian community as well. Philip came here and he preached and that um, resulted in the uh, setting up of a church here in Hierapolis. This is the Byzantine um, gate and you can see evidence there of a cross showing the uh, that um, in the 5th century AD, the Byzantines um, came in here and they changed a lot of things over to Christian things and built churches. And here are the ruins of one of the churches that they built. And here we have the old Greco-Roman amphitheatre, still amazingly well preserved. It was dedicated to the god Bacchus or Dionysius, who is the god of pleasure. And of course the uh, early Christians preached against those kind of gods. And in fact, Philip, uh, Philip the evangelist, he came here and he preached and he preached and the Jews got so upset that they took him outside of this very amphitheater and stoned him. And he's buried over there just outside the city. These old ruins have been significantly affected by the ravages of time by the big earthquake in the um, 737, uh, that's AD, by the Byzantines who pulled things apart so that they could build churches, and then by the Crusaders when they came through here because they pulled things apart too, seeking for treasures. But isn't it great that we can still come here today and see um, evidence of a civilization long ago? We're now in Ephesus, a very famous city that was first settled in the 10th century BC by the Greeks and then rebuilt by um, Alexander the Great's general in the 4th century BC. And over there is the Audion. This is like an auditorium where it has great acoustics for singing and so we are going to hear some beautiful singing. And you probably recognize what this is. This is the medical symbol. So in here we have a pharmacy or, or maybe a medical school. 
Domitian was the first emperor who actually made himself a god and said he was divine. And one wonders how they got into that kind of um, psyche. But anyway, he was the first one and then follows all the um, idols for worship and all of that kind of thing. It's Creating his own temple, here it is here. Creating his own temple, yes. It's just incredible to be able to touch something that was made so long ago and it's so beautifully preserved, but that somebody way back in AD 13, 13 was it? Yeah, had actually carved this and here we are in 2010 and we're touching it. Um, amazing, what an experience. This is the commercial area, so you can see the remains of various shops that they had. And here we have a nice original piece, it's Nike, the goddess of um, victory. Nowadays, of course, it's the goddess of shoes. And here we have the busiest street in Ephesus, it's called Marble Street, and down there is the Library of Celsius. And here we have the public baths, again, in hot, medium and cool water temperatures. And these baths are interesting because they were donated to uh, Ephesus by a woman called Varius. She was obviously very rich and normally uh, women didn't really count in this society. And these are the houses of the rich people on the main road. They had nice mosaics for the uh, sidewalk. They're two story, hot and cold running water. Um, but you had to be rich to live here in the center of town. Now these, these are the communal toilets, so please take a seat. The latrines. The latrines. And the seats here are made of marble, so they used to send in their servants to come in first to warm it up. So they'd sit here for a while, then they, they'd have nice warm seats. And here we have the magnificent uh, library of Celsius, one of the proconsuls of Ephesus. And you can see he's got um, four virtues there of wisdom, of knowledge, of peace, and of science. Wonderful that this is still preserved, isn't it? Now we're heading down into the Agora, the marketplace. And just look at the inscriptions up here. Pretty special to be able to read these some thousands of years later. The Agora is a really large area and that's where all the trade took place um, and all the tourists came too to see it today. And Ephesus's crowning jewel was its amphitheatre. Just look at the size of this. Incredible. It could seat 24,000 people at a time. They still have concerts here today. Unfortunately we can't get in there. But they used to have gladiators and uh, artistic performances, oratory. Fantastic. Paul the Apostle came here to Ephesus of course. He came here three times and a church was established in Ephesus and Paul wrote to that church and that's the book of Ephesians that we still have in the Bible today. And when he was here, um, lots of people became Christians but he was also preaching against um, the goddess Diana and that got the silversmiths who were uh, making statues of Diana very upset. And so they, um, they took Paul and they put him in prison. And so uh, after that he, he, um, he was able to escape and carry on with his ministry. But it's fantastic for me to be able to come here to a place like this where Paul, the great Paul preached, where a church was established that we read about. The, that same church was um, one of the seven churches in Revelation too. And so here we are, it's living Bible history. Really fantastic. It's a privilege to come to Ephesus and um, next time you read about it in the Bible, I hope it'll come alive to you too because you've seen 
these pictures of what Ephesus is like. And there are evidences of early Christianity everywhere. Just on a piece of marble here we've got the uh, Greek cross and in this symbol here are the letters that spell out ekthos, which means fish. And the first letters of ekthos spell out Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Saviour. When you come to a place like this, it does make you realise that you are in a, um, a, a, a whole process of life and of generations, and that today you're part of what happened way back then, and what Paul did here had an impact on us today in 2010, and it, it's quite an incredible thought really, to be standing in the place where all of that happened. And of course, Turkey is famous for its carpets, and they are handmade, silk, each individual knot, and look how beautiful that is. You can tell whether a carpet is handmade by just doing this, and you can see the individual knots, and there's no glue on the back. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colours. And they reckon that one like this would have 36 knots per inch of silk. Fantastic quality. Turkey is very proud of its carpets. You mean like this? They look t totally different in colour, depending on what uh, direction they are. Ooh. That's a silk one. You use it that direction? A hundred knots that direction? per square inch. Wow. Well, the back of it is... These are the remains of the temple of Artemis or Diana, the god of the Ephesians. We're here in Ephesus. And um, this temple here was one of the seven wonders of the world. But unfortunately, what, its remains were sold off to the British Museum. And up there is a temple for St. John castle for St. John, built in the 500s. We're now just outside Ephesus and um, this is considered to be the house of Mary, um, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and also her tomb. On the cross Jesus told John to look after Mary and he and the orthodox tradition is that he brought her here uh, to Ephesus and looked after her. John was exiled from here to Patmos and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation and Mary is supposed to have died here and this place is now a place of pilgrimage for particularly for Catholics so um, who knows whether that really is where she lived or died but um, like many of these places, it's an interesting place to come and see. And you can write messages or wishes or prayers and put them on the wall. I guess it's a, a form of what goes on in Israel with the Wailing Wall, really. Now we're in Bergama, or the ancient uh, city of Pergamum which is one of the seven churches that John wrote to in Revelation. And it's an Acropolis, in other words, a city that is set on the top of a hill. Here we have a temple um, that's dedicated to Trojan. This big temple was um, completed um, in the third century AD by Hadrian. He was the successor to uh, Emperor Trajan. Um, and isn't it amazing how on the top of a massive great hill they can build these great big structures. They just, uh, just are incredible. Well, I suppose they had lots of slaves to do all the work. This is the sanctuary underneath the temple and this is where sacrifices would have been made and uh, the priests lived and look up there you can even see part of the uh, water system that let the water in off the roof. And look at this, every single rock has had to be brought up here and put into place. 
And here we have the amphitheatre and the um, modern city of Pergama or ancient Pergamum down there below. Now we're in the Agora, the big marketplace, and this is a, um, a little shrine to Athena. And over there is something very interesting. It's the biggest library in the world at the time. And the books in the library were made of papyrus, and they used to um, swap them with other libraries, but they wouldn't return them, and ultimately built up 200,000 volumes. And then um, the Egyptians said, well, if you don't return them, we won't lend you any more. So they invented parchment and created their own volumes. That was in about um, 4 AD. Then when the Muslims came to power, unfortunately, they got rid of all the um, papyrus and parchment volumes that weren't um, conducive to Islam, and they were destroyed. And here we have the steepest amphitheatre in the world. And it's got a pretty good view. Look at that. And this is the Temple of Zeus, uh, the, the chief god. And the early Christians were told by John when he wrote the letter um, not to sacrifice to uh, Zeus because this place here was the temple of Satan. Instead they were to repent of their ways and turn back to Jesus Christ who was the only way that they could uh, reach God. And once again it's interesting to visit a site which has had so much history but is also um, an important part of Bible history, a Pergamum with its Acropolis, a city set on the top of a hill. Now we're in the ancient city of Troy, and it goes back 11 millennia before Christ. It occupies a very strategic position. Way in the distance there is the Dardanelles, which um, leads through to the Sea of Marmaris by Istanbul. And so Troy controlled this area. And um, we see here nine different civilizations underneath uh, and above the ground here, with one generation um, being dealt to by war or earthquake, then rebuilt, and so on. And this is the uh, Temple of Athena, where the famous Achilles, the warrior, is, is um, buried. The only way he could be killed was by an arrow through his heel, so-called Achilles' heel. And here we can see the nine different layers of civilization, one being built upon the other, going right up here to the ninth one, the most recent, which finished around about 500 AD. And here's what it would have looked like with the different layers. And here are the remains of uh, an original house dating back two and a half thousand years, made of mud bricks. This is the Schillerman Trench, and Schillerman was a German um, archaeologist, so-called, who who dug down here looking for a treasure hunt. He was really a treasure hunter. He did find it, and he kept it, and he pinched it and took it back to Germany, and after World War II, um, it just all disappeared. It's believed to be in Moscow in a private collection somewhere, but it was never ever seen again. And here we have the Palace of Troy, and I just want to remind you about the, uh, the story that, is, that goes on right here. Helen of Greece was captured by the Trojans and brought here and imprisoned. And so Achilles came here to try and rescue um, Helen, but uh, couldn't. And so then Athena gave a, a really cunning idea. Why don't you declare peace and give them a gift? And so the gift that they gave was a great big wooden horse, but it was filled with soldiers. And so they gave them this horse, and they, they brought the horse up this ramp here. And then that night when the uh, Trojan 
uh, soldiers were all drunk. Out came all the Greek soldiers and they defeated them and they won the victory and they, they got into Troy. And so there's a story from Homer's Iliad. And up there is the Trojan horse. I'm not sure if it's the original one. But the moral of the story is Na prosechete Hellenes pou sa stevene dora which means beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Yes, watch out when Greeks come in bearing gifts. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs>
after having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. We're now back in Istanbul and um, it's strangely familiar, which is really quite a bizarre feeling from when we first started here in Istanbul. Personally, I struggled a little bit with culture shock after coming from Europe, which was so orderly, but eventually got into the groove and um, the highlights for me would have to be Cappadocia with its beautiful um, scenery and natural um, uh, focus points and also um, Ephesus which was a highlight for me as well. I enjoy going through Ephesus even in 41 degrees of heat. Um, there's so much to Turkey. It's so big and the distances are so far but um, it was worth it. <laughs> I don't know that I'll be back though. <laughs> um, but it was a, it was a good tour. Yes, um, I've enjoyed uh, our tour of Turkey too. But again, I don't think I'll be back. Um, for me, the highlights have been seeing the old places, especially the places that were um, linked to Bible times and to see uh, things that were of the past come alive, things that you've read about. And, I, and for me, the thing that touched my heart the most was going to Gallipoli. I was quite surprised because um, seeing that place where so many Australians and New Zealanders died, uh, that really touched me. So Turkey has certainly been a, uh, a lovely country to visit fantastic sights, fantastic scenery, fantastic history, but this has been a tough tour. We've, um, we've struggled with the heat, we've struggled with the distances, but I'm sure glad I came. So thank you very much Turkey, um, and uh, we wish that uh, God's blessing would be upon this country. Uh, we have enjoyed coming here.